Hi, this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. Also, we're live now at blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. And at LibertarianProgressive.com, you'll see 45 to 50 interviews right now of independent and third-party candidates, mostly running for the U.S. Congress. And the reason why we're interviewing independent third-party candidates is because we want to put a light on these candidates. There's so much attention focused on the presidential election, and there's another co-equal branch of government that not many people seem to focus on as much, and we believe it deserves a co-equal amount of time in the media. After all, Congress can override a veto. It can do a lot of different things in their co-equal branch. And most polls say that the uh, American people would throw or elect them all out. Well, let's see if that's really true. Uh, we're presenting independent third-party candidates who specifically are the only independent or third-party candidate in that specific district to make it a little bit easier for you to consider. And keep in mind, the U.S. Congress will decide on laws that are that affect the entire country. And today we're interviewing Paul McCollum for the Constitution Party for, running for the U.S. House of Representatives, District Number 2 in Utah. And he's the only third-party candidate on the ballot, I believe. Hi, Paul. Welcome to the show. And is that true? You're the only independent or third-party candidate on the ballot this year in your district? Yes, sir. It is. All right. And I'm sure you're just as aware of the polling as um, as I am and maybe most other people are, at least the people who've been asked in these polls, that only 25% of people say that they would re-elect their current member of Congress and so what other alternatives are they going to have, the Republican or Democrat? Uh, or maybe in your district, there's the Constitution Party. And so you're giving people another option. And is this your first time running for Congress, sir? Yes, sir, it is. And are there, have there been any debates in your district? Or are there any debates upcoming? There was, there was one debate last week, and... Uh, they only let the Democrat and the Republican. Uh, they said I didn't poll high enough. So, but that's not unusual. If you don't get any airtime, uh, it's hard to get any. It's hard for people to know that you're out there. So, it's a so it's that, a big district. Yeah, that's um, that doesn't seem fair because. You're just as on the ballot as the other candidates, and the taxpayers are paying to have you on the ballot just as much as the other candidates. And some could argue it's kind of like which comes first, the chicken or the egg, the high percentage to get in the debates, or do you have to you know, participate in the debates to get the higher percentage? Well, you know, elections are run by money. Uh, if you can get your name out, you can get more money. Uh, because people donate to you, and but yeah, it's a money game, and and you got to understand the the press is has got leanings one way or another, and they've kind of bought into the thing that we can only have a two party system. If if we have a third party, then it gets too fractured, and we can't get anything done in Congress. So, but that might well, not be a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, most first world. Yeah, that, there you go. Most first world countries um, do have at least four major parties, and they get a lot done. You might not agree with everything that they get done, but they do get things done. I mean, if you think about Germany, Sweden, Switzerland, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, et cetera, and et cetera. Um, so, so, and the only one that doesn't is the United States. And by not keeping or allowing you in the debates, in some sense. They're not allowing the American people uh, to have a full viewing of uh, the different options that are available. They're not letting the American people in the debate pretty much because most people do consider themselves independents, uh, 42%, 29% consider themselves Democrats, and I think 24% consider themselves Republicans. So, you know, you can make the argument that we need a two-party system and you're not polling high enough, but you can look at lots of other statistics that show that people aren't being represented and that the system is not fair either. And so uh, it's not just a feeling, but there are 
actual facts to back that up. And so if you were an incumbent and two years from now you were uh, having some challengers, let's say some Republicans and Democrats, and it would be, let's say if it was in, in your best interest not to debate them, would you shy away from a debate or would you be willing to have a debate and, you know, have an open debate, even if it wasn't to your advantage per se? Well, I don't want to be a career politician. I don't want to be a politician in, in any sense of the word politician. Uh, if, if the people want, the people should have their choice on what they, they get. And, and, so yeah, if 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 you've got four or five people in there, let them all have a say. And if if you get bumped out, it's because people didn't like what you want, what you espousing. And you know, if they want a socialist program, they're gonna they're gonna go towards socialism. And and if you're not socialist, they're gonna they're not gonna want you in there. And it, it doesn't do any good to hide from it. It's it's the way it is. We just need to educate people. And and we haven't done a good job of that. School systems have kind of, you know, the federal government's controlling that with their money. So it it they've gone away from from teaching why this country is great. And so, but yeah, you know, if 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 the people want something different, they want something different. And and as far as I, I wouldn't go more than two terms anyway. It. Who wants to live in Washington half the year? <laughs> yeah, and actually, if people really want the difference, regardless if there's any debates, I mean, I, I guess they do have that choice. And so the Constitution Party, I mean, the name, I guess, kind of speaks for itself in some ways. Um, it, it might be considered somewhat similar to the Libertarian Party, but, but a little bit different. Um, I mean, platform... Uh, you can look at on your website, by the way, which is McCollumforCongress.us, M-C-C-O-L-L-A-U-M-F-O-R Congress.us, and you have your platform there and, and different things like that. Now, on your website itself, you do say here, uh, and you have a couple paragraphs here, so I'll just read the end here. As sure. a member of Congress, that is not – a Republican or Democrat, I realize it is unlikely I could get a bill to the floor of Congress, but that is okay as long as I honor my oath to defend the Constitution by voting against all unconstitutional bills. I will not vote for anything that would go against the Constitution. And like you said, maybe if there was some uh, gridlock with the kind of laws that are being passed, you know, lately, you know, it might be a good thing just to put a stop to it or something like that, or at least have someone who is speaking out and actually entering a little more competition into Congress as well. Nothing like a little bit of competition. I mean, if you're like a gas station and you're the only gas station in town and all of a sudden another gas station opens up across the street, you're going to have a little bit of competition. And so right. maybe a Paul McCollum in Congress might, you know, even – improve the Republican and Democrats a little bit. It might up their game, per se. Um, so you, let's go through some of the issues. I mean, as far as, the, okay. you know, you stand by the Constitution Party platform. You have elections mentioned here. Uh, it's critical, critical that voters know their votes are counted and reported accurately. Uh, you know, and right. I think a lot of people have that feeling with electronic voting. Things can be wiped out easily. People have seen their computers get wiped out easily sometimes unfortunately what, what do you think about the integrity of the voting system and why it's important to have confidence in it well oh i can't remember it was it was two or three elections ago millard county the county i live in got some voting machines from the state of utah they took them and and only they did test on them only a third of them worked and so they sent them off and brought them back, and a third of them worked again, and they so they sent them off, and that that's kind of <laughs> pretty telling when you can have machines that don't work, and they send them off and get them repaired, come back, and they still don't work. And and you, anybody that's familiar with with uh, computers, you can you can do you can program a computer to do anything. Uh, they say they can't be cracked, but uh, you know. 
nobody thought the the Russians would get into the stuff that they've got into, or the hackers that that bust into the the federal government stuff on a regular basis with high security. They, you know, so it wouldn't be hard to to do an election, and elections are a good place for for fraud to go on. You know, if they they've we've had problems with that in some of our cities like Chicago and places like that in the past that they've had problems with even with with paper ballots but it's uh that I I have no problem with with a paper ballot because you can check it you, you can check people's ID but it's I I've voted on those electronic ones you can't you can't tell what you've got in the tally book it's hard to prove that they, and so there's some doubt in my mind that they work. But you know, when the United States went into Iraq, what they didn't bring vote, uh, computer machines in. They they did paper ballots. Right. If if it's so so great, why didn't they bring in voting machines there for those people? That's a good point. And we're talking about fundamental issues here, whether you're on the left side or the right side. I mean, there are some fundamental issues that might need to be looked at, and then we can argue about some of the differences first. But I think there are fundamental sure. consensus-building issues that are at the very core of having confidence in you know, a system. I mean, if you're going to play a game, if you invite some friends to play a game with you, like Monopoly or, or whatever, I mean, you kind of want to make sure the game's fair or less wise. You know, there's no point in playing at that point, you know? Uh, yeah. It might be winners or losers, but at least if you lost, you know you lost in a fair game. And well, it's kind of, kind of have, hard to have a recount and go through and check the ballots again when it's only on a computer. Yeah, it, yep, that's right. And you know, you can, uh, skip, what did they do? Have a uh, recount? They hit, they hit send again, and it and it comes out and says the same thing that it did the time before. It's hard to count that and see if there's something different. So. That's true, and uh, Greg Palast actually is a reporter. If you want to um, look up some articles about voting inconsistencies, I would encourage people to just Google Greg Palast uh, election voting fraud and things like that. He's done a lot of investigative reporting on different kinds of voting systems. So that, that would be a source that uh, you could look at to you know make the case uh, for having a paper trail regarding voting. There's been a lot of investigative reports on it, but that's one person I can think of off the top of my head. So what about gun rights? Uh, a lot of people, um, you know, want to take away our rights to bear arms, although we do have a lot of people who do own guns. And, you know, everyone wants to reduce violence in our society. The Bill of Rights is the Bill of Rights. And and now the latest thing is um, I hear the presidential candidates saying, you know, people on a terrorist no watch list might not be able to buy a gun. What, what say you on the whole debate about guns, if you could sum it up? Well, it says shall not be infringed. If you have not been convicted of a crime where they say that you can't own a gun, what what's the what, – what, why shouldn't you be able to get a gun? I understand, you know, bad guys or or even good people who get angry can can do stupid things with guns, but God gave us that right. The government didn't. Uh, we have the right to have have those things. Uh you know, you can look at you brought up earlier Switzerland has more than one. Switzerland every male over 18 and by my understanding gets issued a weapon. They're part of the National Guard. They take the gun home. You know, if they're part of a mortar crew, they take part of their mortar home. But they, they've got they've got that gun in their house the whole time. Switzerland doesn't have a high crime rate. They don't have people going around. <clears throat> we've got a we've got a problem in the United States with with some lawlessness. But that's uh, why should I be kept from having a gun to protect myself? Because we know, look at Chicago and Washington, D.C., strict gun laws, and yet bad guys get guns all the time, and they pick on good guys, good people, who can't defend themselves. 
So yeah, that's a good yeah, point. I'm, if you took the statistics from just some of the big cities like Chicago and Washington D.C., maybe we would probably not have nearly the gun violence rates. I mean, so I guess the fundamental question is, should 99.9% of the people have restrictions passed on them based on what, you know, less than 0.1% of people decide to do? Yeah. And, and laws don't make us safe. I mean, we have laws so that we can punish people who, who violate, public norms but we we've got laws against drunk driving but people still drive drunk it, you're not going to stop gun violence by outlawing guns in uh england and australia found that out you know uh, it just all it does is it makes it so people who are going to break the laws have them and those of us who are law abiding would not be allowed to have a, something to protect them so yeah, in fact, probably the people who want the gun laws the most are the criminals, um, because then they'll be the only ones who have them. And what about the terror no-fly list? I mean, uh, I think Trump even said in the most recent debate that he would support you know, having some restrictions, although he would try to you know, pay some mind to due process. But you know, if someone's on the terror no-watch list, and do you think... Uh, they should be able to buy a gun? And should we even have a terror no watch list is another question, actually. Yeah, I, I have a problem with the terror no loss. Yeah. Or no fly list, I should say. No fly list. Uh, we've got a law that says that until you're convicted of something, you're, you're innocent and you have rights and privileges. Uh, if we don't want certain people in this country... If they don't have a right to be here, if they're not American citizens, then we should deport them and get rid of them. If if they're American citizens, until they do something wrong, uh, just because they espouse something, you know, we do have freedom of speech, and and we our laws were set up so that we could, as long as we don't break a law, we we're free people supposedly. Uh, so I have a hard time with no watch, you know, the terrorist watch list and no fly list. There's people that get on it because they've got a name similar to somebody else, and and they it takes them years and years, and and they they have a hard time getting off those lists. You know, uh, we've all heard the the horror stories about some of those and people that have young young kids that are on. Their name matches the name on the list, so they can't fly to see Grandma and stuff. But uh, I have a hard time with those. Uh, <clears throat> I understand people are afraid of terrorists, but uh, so far the, this no-fly list and, and everything hasn't stopped anybody from from committing terrorist crimes in the United States. It may have they may have? Well, I, I shouldn't say that. It may have stopped somebody, but I don't know of anybody. But the ones that have actually committed crimes in the United States weren't on the list, and they they got, you know, they committed the crimes anyway. Or we we get to retaliate afterwards legally, and and if we can catch them and, and whatnot. But uh, I have a hard time with those lists. I, and if somebody hasn't broken the law. I don't think they should be convicted by the federal government. It's sure, same as absolutely. I mean, President I think Obama Senator... being being judge and executioner on people who haven't had a trial, and and he sends some drone to kill them. I, I have a hard time with that. That's that that sounds more like communist Russia than and China than it does the United States. At least the United States I grew up believing in. Yeah, I mean, just having a list like that seems kind of Orwellian. I mean, I think Senator Ted Kennedy, the uh, Democrat senator, was on the no-fly list for some short period of time. At least he had the connections probably to be taken off that list. But, yeah, you don't know how you get on that list. You don't know how to get off the list. You don't have a jury of your peers to try you. You don't have a speedy and fast uh, trial. You're not presented with the evidence 
presented in front of you. You have no idea who your accusers are. I mean, these are all due process rules that are right there in the Bill of Rights that, you know, just the no-fly list violates. Plus, being on a no-fly list, it probably tips someone off that now the FBI is watching them. I mean, if the FBI is watching someone, they probably should do it secretly and not announce it on a no-fly list. But uh, Well, uh, yeah, they, they, I have a hard time with, with a lot of what the federal government's doing. You know, a lot of these uh, departments that they've got, like Homeland Security and stuff like that, I question their constitutionality of them. I understand we have a right to to protect ourselves and whatnot, but uh, if they think we should have a, a department like that, they should pass a constitutional amendment and and get that part department part of the Constitution instead of going out of the bounds of what the Constitution said that the federal government can do. So I have right. a little problem with with all these departments. When, I've been told there's over 900 departments in the United States government, and I really can't see where, you know, we have a... The Constitution doesn't give the federal government the right to have a a Department of Education, Department of Energy, and all these other departments that they've got. Uh, I think and it's you have, overreach on the government's part. And you have unelected bureaucrats who are making decisions um, that you know should probably be left for elected representatives as well. Well, and their rules and regulations carry the force of law with them. Uh, you can go to jail for violating something that, that hasn't pass you know your state legislature or the federal you know through the congress it, it they didn't make the law some bureaucrat somewhere uh under the direction of whatever president or whatever you know department head makes up this rule and regulation and it carries the force of law you can go to jail for it that's not right we didn't our constitution wasn't set up that way that we have uh you know basically what they're doing is we've got little nobles and lords in these departments that that make edicts, and then they send the sheriff of Nottingham out to throw you in jail. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 the state of the union right now. And so, so I understand you would get rid of the Department of Education. I, I assume you would, uh, uh, you know, vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act, and um, so those are uh, safe bets. Um, and you bet. Uh, yeah. What about um, the justice system? I mean, we have a lot of we have the highest prison population in any country. I know a lot of this has to do with the state. A lot of it has to do with the war on drugs. And I mean, it's unfortunate that some people get addicted to drugs, but don't people have a right to fail in society if they choose to? And and do states like, you know, some of your neighboring states like Colorado um I mean, should the DEA go in there and stop them from doing, you know, what they are deciding to do as far as the decriminalization of certain drugs, which actually might put some of these big drug cartels out of business? Yeah, they, there's a lot of question on that, you know. And and I, I go again, if if we want a DEA that controls uh, drugs, then they ought to pass a constitutional amendment that says, this we've got this right now we don't have a constitutional amendment that says that and if you look in the constitution it doesn't say anything about the federal government controlling drugs or food or anything else that that if you read the the 10th amendment that that leaves it to the states and the people to decide sure. and and then personally i think drugs are are bad and and i don't want them readily available but uh, it's a, it's a state's right. It's not a federal government right. And and so until they pass an amendment, and they get what 33 or 34 states to to ratify that, they really don't have a right to to do that. You know, That's what they uh, had to do with alcohol with prohibition. And so wouldn't it be the same thing? And yeah, absolutely. Know. You know, and. And you know, I I don't I don't uh, think that the federal government should have a right to 
to say whether alcohol's legal or not. You know, they did pass an amendment saying alcohol was illegal, and then then they passed one saying it was legal. But does the federal government have a right to say what alcohol is legal in what states and what not like that? You know, it's I I think the federal government's overreaching, and 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 like I said, the 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 Ninth Amendment to the Constitution says that if we didn't list a right or freedom in here, we still own that right or freedom. Just because we didn't list it doesn't mean it's not there. And then, like I said, the Tenth says anything that's not given to the federal government, and our founding fathers were real uh, specific about what the federal government could do, and and they have overreached long ways, you know, uh, by and and then then they tax and and they hold this money over the state's heads to if you you know you do what we want you to do then you can get the money back uh, so i think there's been huge overreach on the federal government and and then they keep doing it you know president president obama puts out edicts uh, same as king george we we got tired of that and yet we have the same thing, President Obama, and and he's not the only one. Let's face it; they've been doing it for for 50 years anyway, or more, uh, doing these edicts. But that's we fought a our founding fathers fought a war to get rid of that kind of government. Now, one thing the Constitution does do, I mean, and it does give the states, you know, like Gary Johnson says it like there's 50 laboratories of freedom and and that enables the states to try different things i think that's a nice way of saying it because you know different states can learn from each other and and if one finds a solution to something else and when the government gets involved it might be with good intentions but a lot of times there's so many unintended consequences where it actually makes the problem worse like prohibition but um but the constitution does it, ensure certain rights for everyone across the board, like the freedom of speech, like the right to protect yourself and bear arms, like the right to a free trial, I, I mean a fair trial, and, and to have a jury of your peers. And, and these are all rights. So beyond those rights, but so it does have a place to ensure, you, you know, we have these rights, so we have confidence in the system, but then going beyond that, that's where it's stepping too far. So Right. Uh, so, so there's a, a balance there, and then there's also a balance in power with the states, with the different branches of government. And now you do have abortion listed here. Um, you know, you do uh, believe in the dignity and sanctity of all human life. And let me just ask you a question about that. Do you see sure. any exceptions? And I'm particularly asking about two specific things: um, the life of the mother and in cases of rape or incense, incest, do you think those are two legitimate exceptions or not? Uh, I <clears throat> definitely on the life of the mother, the, the rape and incest that again, falls under States and different, different groups of people have a different belief. Uh, personally, I, I would never I'm male, so I can't speak to the terror and the trauma that goes along with a rape. Uh, that so that 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 one's a tough one. I, the child didn't do anything wrong, uh, but I can understand the 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 feeling there where somebody might want to terminate the child if it was brought about by a, a rape. But I think that as a, a moral people the states should be able to set those boundaries on their own. Personally, I think there's no doubt about if if uh, the life of the mother, uh, then, you know, th you have to sure. pick one of the mm -hmm. one of the two. And, and if if the mother dies, the child dies. So so you take the child to save the mother. But uh, the other one's a tougher one. And, and like I said, I'd have a hard time. Uh, speaking to that, be, I know personally. I think the child hasn't done anything wrong, and so I would, I, if I had the opportunity, I would uh, try to persuade not to kill the child. 
but that that one I could see with with reservations on that on my part allowing the states to do that I wouldn't you know I could understand that because that that's that's a horrendous thing to have for a person to have to live through that would be heartbreaking so yeah. uh I w- uh, but like I said, I would I would uh, try to try to encourage them to let the child live and and then put it up for adoption. But if if it was too much heartbreak or or too much stress, uh, and depending on the age of the the child, that that would fall into the health of the mother. That I could understand that. So. That's How's that fair. for bouncing and, around and not giving you a square answer? <laughs> no, I think I understand what you're saying, and um, you know that's you, you know we appreciate your honesty on on these issues, and some of these are tough questions here. Um, now you also put, I'm going to combine this is on the uh, Constitution Party platform, judicial activism, and juries. Uh, actually, so I think what you're talking about as far as juries go is jury nullification. And if you could explain that a little bit, if that's what it means. Well, uh, yeah, juries have a right to decide whether the law that the person is is being charged with is, is a just law also. Uh, I know, uh, having sat on a jury, the judge tries to, to limit you that you can only look at this and this and, and whatnot, but if you if you read and understand what our founding fathers set up juries were allowed to to decide whether the person was guilty and and whether the law was was a just law if the law wasn't just uh, it, it's like what back in the in the 30s and 40s some states had laws that said black and white people couldn't couldn't get married so if you had a couple come before that were being charged with that as a jury you could say you know that 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 law is not legal these people are are uh innocent so we we're going to let them go because of that so you know that jur- juries people don't understand the power that a jury can have and and the judicial system doesn't really want them to know either because there's a lot of money made on on the legal system and and then the first part of your question uh, judges aren't supposed to make law you you had our supreme court justice twist around to make it so that he could make obamacare legal he had to he had to put influence in there that wasn't even argued in the first place so you know that we have a lot of judges that instead of they they're supposed to rule on the laws but they they're saying whether laws are legal or not and and they're taking away rights of states in the process because they don't believe what what's going on and and unfortunately we've got a congress that's got no backbone otherwise you know they could have gone they could go any time and say this is the law and the supreme court and no other courts can rule on it it's like marriage sanctity of marriage that marriage is between a man and a woman, Congress could issue that and say, uh, and and the courts can't rule on this, and and it'd be done. But again, that's, I think I think that's a state's rights because nowhere in the Constitution did it say the federal government has the right to do anything with marriage. That's that's, that's a state or a a church right. I I I even think that state. The only reason the states are involved in it is so they can tax you on a on a license. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a very, very good point. And let me ask you about foreign policy, because if you're elected to Congress, okay. you, know, you might vote on war and peace. And, you know, we are we have the biggest military in the world. And, of course, we want to have, uh, you know, the top military. But. Have we gone too far in that direction? And are we an empire? Are we a republic? Um, is it our? Should, should we be the policemen of the world? I mean, do we have a duty with the responsibility of being the biggest country to make sure, 
everyone is free or, you know, what do you say about that, uh, our foreign policy? Where should it be? Well, I have to go back to the Constitution again. The, the Constitution doesn't give us the right to be the policemen of the world. Nowhere in there does it say that we can look at a country and say, you know, they're, they're, this dictator is over there, and he's not a good guy, so we've got the right to go and take him out. And I know they've used uh, 9-11 as a, as a springboard to do a lot of this stuff, but if, being logical, 9-11, we had, what, 15 of the 19 terrorists were all Saudi Arabians, we didn't go to war with Saudi Arabia. We went and we deposed Afghanistan. Yeah, they had nasty people, but are they any better off now than what they were then? Uh, we went into Iraq without a declaration of war. We have this fuzzy, quasi, feel-good thing about a war on terrorism, but, but we attacked sovereign nations without a declaration of war. And and that goes against the Constitution, and and usually with a declaration of war we stipulate what we're doing in there. If you go back and look, when we went to war with in World War II, the declarations of war against Japan and and Germany specified what our grievance was and what you know why we were going to war. We don't have that with that. We're in Syria right now fighting a war. We've got combat troops on the ground, American soldiers, there by orders of the federal government with no declaration of war. It's been more than 60 days. The, you know, the, the little law that they've got says the president can engage troops within 60 days, and if there's no declaration of war, he's got to retract them. So here we've got these wars going on around the world that we're getting involved in, and the Constitution doesn't give us the right to do that. Yet, Iraq didn't attack us. Even even uh, Afghanistan did not attack us. Yeah, Osama bin Laden was there, but he, that country did not attack us. They harbored a fugitive. But if we're going after terrorists, I mean, Iran, we know, is one of the big sponsors. So is North Korea. China has been in the past, and Russia still trains those people so we haven't attacked them why do we go we go out and and do these quasi wars pseudo wars whatever where we get to put our hardware and people up against the russians or the chinese hardware or or some you know and it's all unconstitutional and it is extremely expensive it costs the american taxpayers grundles and and it's not just us, it's our children and grandchildren are going to have to pay for this if we don't go totally bankrupt as a country because of this stupid spending. You know. Yeah, we're spending I'm a, a lot. Farmer. I mean Yeah. And go ahead. and if if I had if I farmed for 50 years going into debt every year by as much as I was the last year, Pretty soon the banker would say, stop, you can't do this, this is stupid. And and they put an end to it. Our congressmen can't seem to pull their head out and say, whoa, wait a minute, we can't spend this much money anymore. It's just not right. They just keep doing it. It's those stupid omnibus bills where everybody gets to throw all their pork in and you, get, you vote it up or down and... And they're so afraid of shutting down the government, which is big deal. Shut down the government. It's not supposed to be this big anyway. <laughs> sure. And, you know, we're defending Europe. We're defending South Korea. We're defending all these, like, Saudi Arabia. And at the same time, you, you know, their economy is doing, you know, somewhat better. They're not nearly in as much debt. You know, they have health care for all their citizens. You know, maybe they can defend the, their, themselves, you know, and that's maybe another thing we can learn from Switzerland. Um, so wh what about freedom just in general? I think a lot of people have forgotten what freedom is. I mean, you said you're a farmer. I mean, people, you know, it's illegal to even buy raw milk now. I mean, you have to say you're buying it for something else to even get it. I mean, I think people 
have, you know, I understand having some kind of system like the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. So you're in a system where, you know, there's an even playing field. But I think people have forgotten what it's like to just even be able to go out into nature and find a land and build on it and start a business and not just have all this red tape. And, you know, what, what, what are, what's freedom about? Well, what have we and, forgotten and about freedom? We, we've forgotten so much about it. And, and the problem is people say, well, the federal government will protect me from shysters and from bad food and and stuff then then I'm safer and uh they so they 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 push that it was funny I was I was talking to my niece uh and she's a little bit more liberal than I am and and I was saying well you understand for the government to do this you're going to have to give up some freedom and she goes I have no problem giving up my freedom for that i says but in the process you're stealing my freedom to say otherwise and and that's that's what we've got we've got people that have gone to the government and says protect me and in the process they lose so much and they don't understand what they're they're giving up and part of it is because they're not being educated on on what made this country great and you know the freedom to to go out and try something and fail and and not have you know start over again but everybody wants to be protected they don't want to they don't want to have to fall in a hole and and not have somebody pick them up and dust them off and say here you know you you shouldn't have you you, you shouldn't have done that but it's all right here's your you know we'll take care of you and send you on your way and and it, you know, it used to be it was buyer beware, and so you would look things over and you'd study things over. Now they want the federal government to to protect you from it, and and so the price of everything goes up. Yeah, sure. And people it don't becomes understand. like a rigged system. I mean, you have like insiders in the FDA now, and they make it hard for their competitors to compete because they add all these regulations that only you know billionaire companies can afford to you know go by, and um. And, and and the companies will will complain. Oh, we got all these regulations, but those regulations are the best thing for them because it, like you said, it cuts out competition. If you and I want to start a new car company, we can't. We can't just start in our garage and build one or two cars and sell them, and and you know get a name and going because the federal government says you got to pass all these these crash tests, and and most of the big car companies have to give up. Uh, a huge number of cars that you and I couldn't come up with to crash and the, for the government to crash and wreck to see if they're safe or not. The the founding fathers had a had a thing for that too. They made it so you could file suit against somebody if if they had you know, they had wronged you, and that that's where that should be. That shouldn't be the federal government shouldn't be our protector over everything because they can't. It's just impossible. You know, yeah, I think so. a good compromise would be like if someone wanted to buy food that was FDA approved, if a farmer wanted to have a label on their food saying it was FDA inspected, they should have to pay like a yearly fee, and then they could advertise on that label, but it should be completely voluntary. And the amount of fees that they pay to have that labeling and that inspection, that would go to fund the FDA. And so the FDA would be completely voluntary, um, and the people that choose not to have it, it would be buyer beware. And uh, well, you know that would be it'd be even better than that because the federal government wouldn't do be the FDA. You would have a private enterprise out there that says we will send inspectors out. We'll guarantee this food to be this thing, and so it'd be a private industry instead of a federal bureaucracy, and and our government wouldn't have anything to be involved with it. Private individuals will come up with all these things if, and and do them and make money at it, and do it cheaper than the government because the government is wasteful. No matter what anybody says, you put people in the government, guarantee them their jobs, and they become wasteful. And so, I don't think there ought to be an FDA associated with the government. You know that 
what was it the the good house housekeeping seal of approval or whatever that uh sure. goes on electronics and stuff that's not the federal government that's private testing group that does it so you know the people will do it they will there will be people that will inspect it or or whatever you know companies will have their own inspection and guarantee certain items you know it it would be done the federal government does not have to be involved in it they are wasteful and and in the process you know our founding fathers set this up so that we'd have our freedom and so the government is not supposed to do anything to you that I can't do to you so I can't go to you and say with a gun because that's what a taxpayer you know that's the way they collect taxes they'll send people with guns throw you in jail I can't go to your house with a gun and say give me your money I'm going to go give it to that person or that person because they need it no matter how good the cause is I can't do that the federal government's not supposed to do it either if if you want to be charitable you can be charitable and and that was one of the big complaints when FDR started all his programs in the, in the 30s was the charity charity groups started complaining that people quit paying to charities when the government started taxing them to do those soup you know same as soup kitchens and and make work details and stuff so yeah and, I and, think and the government's way for it you would vote against if there was the opportunity to get rid of the income tax as well, <laughs> right? Is that fair to say? Or you bet. The federal federal okay. government's got other places they get revenue from. Uh, they don't need income tax. Uh, I, and I'd shut down the. I, I'd cut that corporate tax. People people say, well, let's let's tax big corporations. Really? Who pays the taxes when you go and buy a Ford? or a Chevy or a Dodge car and and the government puts 40% taxes on it, where do you think those taxes come? From you buying that that vehicle or if you buy a VCR or whatever whatever those companies do it, and in the process they move outside the country, move away. I mean, since since I was a kid, look at all the industry that has left the United States and those were good paying jobs. Yeah, they were hard working jobs, but they paid good. The steel mills and stuff like that. Those were good paying jobs. And and they've wonder, all gone outside um, the country. You wonder if some of these corp big conglomerates like really want less regulation because like we were saying earlier, um some of these FDA rules and regulations and some of these other regulations actually benefit you know, the biggest of the big corporations, it's really the small and mid-sized sure. and maybe a little bit larger that would benefit the most. Because you do have a presidential candidate out there saying that they would get rid of the corporate tax. But and you would think all the corporations would candidate and they would, you know, be doing a lot better because they would get a lot more donations. You think that would make corporations' eyes, like, you know, <laughs> widen up and, and be like, wow, there's a candidate that's for that. But you know, just like everything else, it probably benefits some of the really, really big companies to have an income tax because it probably hurts their competitors. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think you would have, you know, an immigration problem with corporations coming to this country if you got rid of, you know, income tax and corporate tax. It is kind of a double taxation because you're taxing all the shareholders and then you're taxing the corporation itself. I mean, there's a constitutional argument whether one should even have you know, legal corporations anyways, um, who are limited liability. I mean, people do have a right to organize. But um, now, th let's see if uh, if you're, um, let's say there is a wave of discontent and you happen to be elected on that wave, you, you know, even if you're not in the debates, which we hope that you do get to be in the debates, and I hope you challenge the challengers and they accept it because you are on the ballot. But even if you can't pass all the legislation that you want to pass, what would be the message that, you know, you would want your constituents to get from electing you? I mean, what kind of message would it send? Because I can understand people not wanting to waste their vote on a presidential election. You know, maybe a vote for a third party might help the lesser of the two evils get elected. And, you know, they're kind of wary about that. 
However, they can't really make that same argument when it comes to the Congress because there's 435 members and there's quite a buffer there. So there's really not as much of a risk for voting for a third party candidate for Congress. And so what would that do to the national debates if you were elected as a congressperson? Well, it, it'd give validity that a, a third party candidate could get in. Uh, and like I said, I, I have no doubt that I couldn't put any, get any bills to the floor. The, the Democrats and Republicans would, are going to shut you down. Uh, you might be able to co-sponsor a bill, but, but uh, you're not going to get anything on the floor. But the biggest thing is to vote against these unconstitutional things. And you got to start somewhere. You know, if our founding fathers, if we took the theory that we have today, that people have today and say, well, a third party can't win, so we can't go that way, our founding fathers would have never fought England. They'd have never, because everybody looked at it and goes, man, England was the biggest Navy and the the biggest, baddest boy on the block. And 13 colonies had no funding to speak of. They they were they were the the weak need little kid, but yet they stood up and it took them, you know, quite a few years to to do it. And the Lord was on their side and they, and and they won and and whatnot. But that that you got to start somewhere. And if you don't start somewhere you'll never get there. If you're always doing the lesser of two evils, you're still voting for an evil. And I, I have nothing against my current congressman. He's probably a nice guy, other than he votes unconstitutionally about 30% of the time. And it's it it's a nasty one. Uh, he Two years ago when he ran, he ran that... He'd help get rid of Obamacare and reduce the size of government and, and government spending. First thing he did when he got in, and he was reelected, but he when he got in in January, he voted for the omnibus bill, provided more money than what what they needed. It funded Obamacare for another year. It funded huge pork, and 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 a lot of unconstitutional things there, and and. That's what's killing this country. We we have, if we have our congressmen start voting constitutionally, that now there's some things that you can vote for constitutionally that will be constitutional but that may not be wise. We shouldn't spend more money than what we bring in, even even for our court systems and and for our our military and our navy. We're allowed to have a full time navy, uh, you know, but. If if we're if we're deep in debt, we need to cut back, and and not spend ridiculously on there. And, and the government does waste a lot of money in 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 our military and and every other department they have. There, there's waste everywhere. So and even if you're liberal in your district or if you're disgruntled Republican. I mean, hopefully, when people are talking about politics this Thanksgiving after the election. I mean, wouldn't it be nice to have someone in there that is at least just going to send a message for two years? And, I mean, there is 435 members of Congress. And so let me just ask you the final question here, Paul. We appreciate your time very much to educate the public about your positions, how you would approach going to Congress, um, you know, what your principles are. What uh, who are some of your favorite people, past or present? Well, I I got to start out with my dad. He was he was a great guy. He's not alive anymore, but he he was in the military for 22 and a half years. I really liked my dad. Really got along good with him. Uh he's the one that got me started in going on on patriotism and and a love of this country and and I've taken it and and run with it and studied a little bit more and I and I am by far not a, a scholar on the constitution there's people that i listen to that are just fabulous scholars and, and understand a lot better than i do but then i you gotta you gotta love george washington 
after the Revolutionary War, some of his officers came to him and says, we can make you king. And he goes, what did we just fight this war for, guys? Come on. You know, that paraphrasing in it. He said it a lot more dignified than I did. Uh, him and Jefferson both told us to stay out of Europe and keep our nose out of there and not get tied to them with treaties, to to trade with them and be friends with them, but stay out of their politics. And their politics have killed us by getting involved in them. And uh, I, I really... I really have a, a a real admiration for them, and and our other founding father Benjamin Franklin was a was a great guy, and very knowledgeable. Had uh, all of them were very God fearing men. Had a had a belief in 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 uh, God and and His intervention in in life and and in their in their fight for freedom. So th- those are the the big ones i i there's a few other people that have passed on that nobody'd know that I won't mention <laughs> well that's all right we that's a good insight there and um yeah speaking about god bearing it's uh we're you know to bring, bring a light be a light in the world and so i think that's what you're trying to do is be a light in the world be a light to freedom and you know i think uh john adams said the kind of government that we have it's only going to work with the moral people. And so, you know, that's true. He did. Yeah. And we have, you know, we can be, have, make a vote for freedom. And so, well, good to talk to you today, um, Paul. And do you have any final words of wisdom, sir? Uh, you know, pray about it and make the right choice. The lesser of two evils is still an evil. Vote, vote for the person that is, and and we're all fall, flawed. Uh, you know, nobody's perfect, but you need to you need to pray about it, ask for some inspiration, and and uh, vote for the person that that is the best that would do the best job, uh, no matter what party they belong to, and and if the American people do that, God will bless this country. It, he blesses it a lot, but. He would bless us with a better government, I guarantee. <laughs> so. All right, Paul. Well, we do thank you for your time. Good luck in your campaign. There's uh, you know, about 30 days remaining. And thank you for joining us here at LibertarianProgressive.com, where this interview will be re-uploaded later on in about 24 hours. And I hope you have a pleasant evening, Paul, and enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thanks again. All right. Thank you, and you too. Bye-bye.